This is a video I've been wanting to make for years, and people have been nagging me to do so. Anyways, this here is not your typical IBM laptop from the 90s. Now this one over here, however, is, but that's not the point of this video here. So back in 2012, I was given as a gift a very particular IBM laptop. Now, if we go back to June of 1995, IBM was currently in the midst of a weird little debacle between Motorola, IBM, it's, uh, itself actually in that case there, and Apple and a few others. There was an attempt to try and make what was known as CHRP, the Common Hardware Reference Platform. That was the use of a power PC chip and similar PC hardware in order to make some sort of architecture that all fit together on different platforms and operating systems. One of IBM's products, and they've already been trying it for a little while now, was PowerPC th uh, ThinkPads. This laptop here is the Model 850 from IBM. This particular laptop here, um, it's huge. Like, this laptop here, this is the IBM 380XD. Um, slightly later, I believe, 233 megahertz CPU. And it's actually, I would say, about two or three millimeters thinner. Otherwise, though, the speakers on the front of the 850 here are absurdly huge. And we're still not done with the possible options that you could get here yet. There was still um, a camera module that clipped on to the top of the screen and then even made it more convoluted. It was just a ridiculous laptop all the way around and then crammed inside of it was a PowerPC 601 chip. But let's take a look at the actual laptop itself. Well, first off, it's quite obvious that it's an IBM product, and it does a fantastic job. It has the CD drive right here in the front. We also have our headphone jack, and there's another jack here, which I believe is microphone as well. And on this side here, we have a little tiny key locking connector. And I'm not entirely sure, again, how the hell that's supposed to work, but whatever. On this side here, we do have our power switch. We also have two more audio jacks, which seem to be line in and line out. And we have some sort of expansion connector here, which is hiding behind a little tiny plastic clip. It's also worth pointing out at this time here, because this is a ThinkPad product, I'm trying to be very careful with this because at this age, the rubberization or rubberish material that IBM put under the ThinkPad is starting to decay and it's making them sticky and they're prone to attacking, attaching to dust and getting really messy. So bear with me here. But we'll put this clip back in. If I can get it back in the back there, there we go. And on the back here, we have our power connector right here. And by the way, I'd like to point out the power connector for the 850 is an absolute brick, but it is rated as it reads here on the back 22 output is 20 to 10 volts 2.20 to 3.38 amps is there more than one no okay yeah that's exactly how it works anyways yeah look at the size of this thing massive but going back to here again power connector and we have this little flip down door here and i'll pop that open and it gives us all of our standard connections we got serial we have parallel we have vga we have i believe a power and reset button here we have this connector here for the external floppy drive, and I have one of those floppy drives with me right now. It looks like this. This one here is the 2.88 megabyte model. And in fact, if you were to crack this open, you'll find out it's a rather standard IBM floppy, um, ThinkPad floppy drive inside of it. But IBM over the years used at least three different connections of our, for their external floppy drives. So these can be a bit of a pain to find. Moving on, however, we have as well this here, a micro 50 pin SCSI port that's hiding away here. And then we have these two yellow connections. We have RCA video, uh, composite jacks for uh, video in and video out. And there's a very cool video overlay system here um, that lets you, in my case, I've been able to play back video onto the screen itself. And it's okay. Recording functions, not so much. Uh, output functions, haven't really figured that one out yet either. Looking on to the other side here, we have, is that it? There we go. This um, opening here, we have space for two PCMCIA slots. This machine here came with a token ring card. Um, I've used an ethernet card in this thing here to get it onto the network, but otherwise there's no built-in networking on it. 
Uh, over here, we do have one PS2 port for the mouse, and we have this mysterious jack that's hiding up here, and I have no idea what that is. Uh, if you can tell me, please, um, I'd love to know. I got no manuals with this thing here. It was just the machine only. And behind this cover right here, we have our primary battery, um, which will snap out of here. And I'm not sure, yes, this is a nickel metal hydrate battery. Um, it does come in IBM's little classic, like weird shape of a battery, but otherwise that just slides in. I don't know what this on and off switch here does either. So otherwise I'm just going to snap that in there and we can close it up. Now that's not all that when it comes to poking around on the 850, we can actually look, open up the top here and there's even more beyond the keyboard. But for starters, let's look at what we got here. We have this fantastic LCD screen here. I believe the 860 features a larger version of the LCD screen here. On the very top, we have this, there's a snap panel here. I really don't want to play with it too hard, but it's just a set of row of connectors in here. And that's where your camera attaches to. But otherwise, we have our slider knobs for our brightness and our contrast. Again, we have IBM's fantastic uh, red, green, and blue colorful dial or um, logo here. This is a track point enabled device, so we do have a track point nub in its usual location here with buttons down at the bottom. Otherwise, there's nothing other, uh, special about this keyboard. However, now that we have this open, there's two tabs right here. There's no latches, there's no interlocks, nothing. But if I just lift that up, I can then swing open the keyboard, and then suddenly I have access to, this has always been broken. This is actually a broken hinge over here. This is not supposed to happen. But you look inside, and if I try not to break it, you can also see that we have our hard drive is over here, our optical drive in the middle, and there's our battery over here, as well as our two stereo speakers at the very bottom. And if I grab on the bracket here and pull, no, I can't pull this out, can I? No, I can hmm, odd, there we go. If I were to pull that out, and you'll find out that underneath that, usually there would be two battery uh, backup batteries here. There's the CR2032 that's hiding here, and there'd be a green one here, which I've removed because those do leak, and it's strongly suggested you remove it if you haven't done so already. And then you have these DRAM cards. These cards here are your RAM. The system requires two of these DRAM cards to work. So in my case here, I have 16 megabytes of RAM in this machine. And the strange, it looks like a PCMCIA card, but the actual pins here are staggered, so you cannot physically fit this into a PCMCIA slot. All right, so I think I'm just gonna get this thing back together. I'm gonna boot this thing up, and it does, by the way, make a very cool little noise once it completes its self-test. But it otherwise takes forever to log in. I'm just gonna quickly give you an idea of what the operating system looks like on this here. So eventually you're able to boot the machine up and surprise, we're currently on this machine right here running the AIX um, operating system environment from IBM. Now, because this was the common hardware reference platform, you had other options available to you as well. This included Microsoft Windows NT for PowerPC, or you had OS2 Warp for PowerPC. Now, that last little bit there for OS2 Warp, you will see it floating around, but it's worth pointing out that's a beta piece of software. So there is a lot of things about it that don't work. More so with Windows NT, if you're gonna get Windows NT installed onto a PowerPC machine, at least get something cool to show off with it, like a killer app. But there really aren't any killer apps. These were both operating systems where it was, yo, um, yeah, uh, I'm running on, on, yeah, I'm running on PowerPC. Isn't that cool? Compile software for me. So me, I'm kind of a purist in that regard here. So that's why I'm currently using um, AIX and well, CDE because there's the most software available via AIX for PowerPC because there was the whole RS6000 line. And me struggling here, I'm legitimately trying to open stuff but I can't see everything because it's upside down. No, I don't want the text editor, get out of here. I don't want the text editor. I don't want the text editor. I need the context window behind you. Thank you, there we go. So I'm just gonna open that up. But anyways, you end up with CDE 
And then there's a couple of nice killer apps. Well, okay, maybe killer apps is the wrong word to use here. There's a number of very large applications that were available for AIX. AutoCAD comes to mind immediately, and is one thing that would take serious advantage of the processing powers of the RS6000. Me, however, I don't have any of that. So, really all I can do is boot the machine up into a very standard AIX install, and that's about it. I have no installation packages or extra media that would be able to help me out here. This system here is, by the way, not booting from a small, say, 200 or 500 megabyte, two and a half inch SCSI disk. This is booting from a rather uncommon one gigabyte, two and a half inch SCSI hard drive. Not many of those are floating around out there. So if you find one of those, oh man, that's awesome. But otherwise, there's not much to really show around or demonstrate here. If you've seen CDE running on, say, Solaris or HPUX, you aren't missing much. There's not a whole hell of a lot that's different here as well. So I think there's not much else I can do here but try and shut down. And this is the fun part because I'm working upside down, so I have to figure out, one, where the hell the console is, and two, um, how to sh type in. There we go, terminal. And I just want it to shut down now. And it's marginally fast. Okay, let's try this. These are my hands working upside down. So S H U T D. Everything's backwards. O W N. And we'll just say now uh, O W. Um, I really wish I did have something that could better demonstrate what was going on with this uh, with the operating system and just what advantages I guess you could have from running AIX portably like this, but this is not the operating system of my choice. I, I've, I've never worked with it. I really can't help you here. So I don't know of anything special that I could show off right now. If there's demos that I'm missing, please leave a comment down below. Um, if people are nagging me hard enough here like they have been for the last couple of years to make a video in the first place, um, okay, maybe I'll revisit this. But anyways, this thing's just gonna log me out apparently and not actually, no wait, it is actually shutting me down. And there we go. And well, there you have it. That is the ThinkPad 850. This is the laptop that on eBay fetches several hundred dollars. It's a highly collectible device. It's IBM's very valiant attempt at the common hardware reference platform, but ultimately it was an unsuccessful product. Maybe if you were running AIX and you were using some sort of server-based application where you had remote licenses, ah, yeah, sure, why not? You have kind of brought it to your portable office and you were able to do several different iterations of a piece of software. But other than that, not a whole hell of a lot else to it besides it's a giant block of a system with a giant brick of a power supply and an external floppy drive. Thank you for watching. See you next time.